The Perks of Being a Wallflower, May 11th, 1992. Dear friend, I've been spending a lot of time with Patrick these days. I really haven't said much. I just kind of listen and nod because Patrick needs to talk. But it isn't like it was with Mary Elizabeth. It's different. It started out on Saturday morning after the show. I was in my bed trying to figure out why sometimes you can wake up and go back to sleep and other times you can't. Then my mom knocked. Your friend Patrick's on the phone. So I got up and wiped away the sleep. Hello? Get dressed. I'm on my way. Click. That was it. I actually had a lot of work to do since it was getting closer to the end of the school year, but it sounded like we might be having some kind of adventure, so I got dressed anyway. Patrick pulled up about 10 minutes later. He was wearing the same clothes he wore the night before. He hadn't showered or anything. I don't even think he went to bed. He was just wide awake on coffee and cigarettes and mini thins, which are these small pills you can buy at quick marts or truck stops. They keep you awake. They're not illegal either but they make you thirsty. So I climbed in Patrick's car, which was filled with cigarette smoke. He offered me one, but I said, not in front of my house. Your parents don't know you smoke? No, should they? I guess not. Then we started driving, fast. At first, Patrick didn't say much. He just listened to the music on the tape player. After the second song started, I asked him if it was the mixtape I made him for Secret Santa Christmas. I've been listening to it all night. Patrick had this smile all over his face. It was a sick smile, glazy and numb. He just turned up the volume and drove faster. I'll tell you something, Charlie, I feel good. You know what I mean? Really good. Like I'm free or something. Like I don't have to pretend anymore. I'm going away to college, right? It'll be different there. You know what I mean? Sure, I said. I've been thinking all night about what kind of posters I want to put up in my dorm room and if I'll have an exposed brick wall. I've always wanted an exposed brick wall so I can paint it. Know what I mean? I just nodded this time because he didn't really wait for a sure. Things will be different there. They have to be. They will be, I said. You really think so? Sure. Thanks, Charlie. That's kind of how it went all day. We went to see a movie and we ate pizza. And every time Patrick started getting tired, we got coffee and he ate another mini thin or two. When things started turning dusk outside, he showed me all the places he and Brad would meet. He didn't say much about them, he just stared. We ended up at the golf course. We sat on the 18th green, which was pretty high on a hill, and we watched the sun disappear. By this point, Patrick had bought a bottle of red wine with his fake ID, and we passed it back and forth, just talking. Did you hear about Lily? He asked. Who? Lily Miller. I don't know what her real first name was, but they called her Lily. She was a senior when I was a sophomore. I don't think so. I thought your brother would have told you. It's a classic. Maybe. Okay, stop me if you heard it. Okay? So Lily comes up here with this guy who was the lead in all the plays. Parker? Right, Parker. How did you know? My sister had a crush on him. Perfect. We were getting pretty drunk, so Parker and Lily come up here one night, and they are so in love. He even gave her this his thespian pin or something. At this point, Patrick is spitting out wine between sentences. He's laughing so hard. They even had a song, something like Broken Wings by that band, Mr. Mister. I don't even know, but I hope it was Broken Wings, because it would make the story perfect. Keep going, I encouraged. Okay, okay. He swallowed. So they've been going out for a long time, and I think they've even had sex before, but this was going on. This was going to be a special night. She packed a little picnic, and he brought a boombox to play Broken Wings. Patrick just couldn't get over that song. He laughed for 10 minutes. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. So they have this picnic with sandwiches and everything. They start to make out. The stereo's playing, and they're just about to do it when Parker realizes he forgot the condoms. They're both naked on this putting green. They both want each other. There's no condom, so what do you think happened? I don't know. They did it doggy style with one of the sandwich bags. No, was all I could really say. Yes, was Patrick's rebuttal. God, was my counter. Yes, was Patrick's conclusion. After we shook off the giggles and wasted most of the wine with spit takes, he turned to me. And you want to know the best part? What? She was the valedictorian, and everyone knew it when she went up to give her speech. There's nothing like the deep breaths after laughing that hard. Nothing in the world like a sore stomach for the right reasons. 
It was that great. So Patrick and I shared all the stories we could think of. There was a kid named Barry who used to build kites in art class. Then after school, he would attach firecrackers to the kite and fly it and blow it up. He's now studying to be an air traffic controller. Patrick's story via Sam. And then there was this kid named Chip who spent all of his money from allowance and Christmas and birthdays to buy bug killing equipment. And he would go door to door asking if he could kill the bugs for free. My story via my sister. There was a guy named Carl Burns and everyone called him CB. And one day CB got so drunk at a party that he tried to fuck the host's dog. Patrick's story. And there was this guy they called Action Jack because supposedly he was caught masturbating at a drunk party. And at every pep rally, the kids would clap and chant, Action Jack, clap, 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 Action Jack. My story via my brother. There were other stories and other names. Second base Stace, who had breasts in the fourth grade and let some of the boys fill them. Vincent, who took acid and tried to flush a sofa down the toilet. Sheila, who allegedly masturbated with a hot dog and had to go to the emergency room. The list went on and on. By the end, all I could think was what these people must feel like when they go to their class reunions. I wonder if they're embarrassed, and I wonder if that's a small price to pay for being a legend. After we sobered up a bit with coffee and mini thins, Patrick drove me home. The mixtape I made for him hit a bunch of winter songs, and Patrick turned to me. Thanks, Charlie. Sure. No, I mean in the cafeteria. Sure. After that, it was quiet. He drove me home and pulled up in the driveway. We hugged goodnight, and when I was just about to let go, he held me a little tighter, and he moved his face to mine, and he kissed me. A real kiss. Then he pulled away real slow. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Really, I'm sorry. No, really, it was okay. So he said thanks and hugged me again, and moved in to kiss me again, and I just let him. I don't know why. We stayed in his car for a long time. We didn't do anything other than kiss, and we didn't even do that for very long. After a while, his eyes lost the glazy, numb look from the wine or the coffee or the fact that he had stayed up the night before. Then he started crying. Then he started talking about Brad. And I just let him because that's what friends are for. Love always, Charlie. May 17th, 1992. Dear friend, it seems like every morning since that first night, I wake up dull and my head hurts and I can't breathe. Patrick and I have been spending a lot of time together. We drink a lot. Actually, it's more like Patrick drinks and I sip. It's just hard to see a friend hurt this much, especially when you can't do anything except be there. I want to make him stop hurting, but I can't, so I just follow him around whenever he wants to show me his world. One night, Patrick took me to this park where men go to find each other. Patrick told me that if I didn't want to be bothered by anyone, that I should just not make eye contact. He said that eye contact is how you agree to fool around anonymously. Nobody talks, they just find places to go. After a while, Patrick saw someone he liked. He asked me if I needed any cigarettes, and when I said no, he patted my shoulder and walked away with this boy. I just sat on a bench, looking around. All I saw were the shadows of people, some on the ground, some by a tree, some just walking. It was so quiet. After a few minutes, I lit a cigarette and I heard somebody whisper. You got an extra cigarette? The voice asked. I turned around and saw a man in shadow. Sure, I said. I reached out to hand the man a cigarette. He took it. You got a light? He said. Sure, I said. And I struck a match for him. Instead of just leaning down and lighting the cigarette, he reached out to make a cup around the match with our hands, which is something we all do when it's windy, but it wasn't windy. I think he just wanted to touch my hands because while he was lighting the cigarette, he did it for a lot longer than necessary. Maybe he wanted me to see his face over the glow of the match. To see how handsome he was. I don't know. He did look familiar, but I couldn't figure out from where. He blew out the match, thanks, and exhaled. No problem, I said. Mind if I sit down? He asked. Not really. He sat down and said a few things, and it was his voice. I recognized his voice, so I lit another cigarette and looked at his face again and thought hard, and that's when I figured it out. It was the guy who does the sports on the TV news. Nice night, he said. I couldn't believe it. I guess I managed to nod because he kept talking about sports. He kept talking about how the designated hitter in baseball was bad and why basketball was a commercial success and what teams looked promising in college football. He even mentioned my brother's name, I swear. 
All I said was, so what's it like being on television? It must have been the wrong thing to say because he just got up and walked away. It was too bad because I wanted to ask him if he thought my brother would make it to the pros. Another night, Patrick took me to this place where they saw poppers, which is this drug you inhale. They didn't have poppers, but the guy behind the counter said that he had something that was just as good. So Patrick bought that. It was in this aerosol can. We both took a sniff of it, and I swear we both thought we were going to die of a heart attack. All in all, I think Patrick took me to about every place there is to go that I wouldn't have known about otherwise. There was this karaoke bar on one of the main streets in the city, and there was this dance club, and this one bathroom and this one gym, all these places. Sometimes Patrick would pick up guys, sometimes he wouldn't. He said that it was hard being safe, and you never know. The nights he would pick up someone always made him sad. It's hard, too, because Patrick began every night really excited. He always said he felt free, and tonight was his destiny, and things like that. But by the end of that night, he just looked sad. Sometimes he would talk about Brad. Sometimes he wouldn't. But after a while, the whole thing just wasn't interesting to him anymore, and he ran out of things to keep himself numb. So tonight, he dropped me off at home. It was the night we went back to the park where men meet, and the night he saw Brad there with some guy. Brad was too into what he was doing to notice us. Patrick didn't say anything. He didn't do anything. He just walked back to the car, and we drove in silence. On the way, he threw the bottle of wine out the window, and it landed with a crash. And this time, he didn't try to kiss me like he had every night. He just thanked me for being his friend and drove away. Love always, Charlie.